We're going to get started. My name is Ron Klein, and I'm chairman of the Jewish Democratic Council of America. In the two plus years since our founding, JDCA has established itself as the voice of Jewish Democrats, advocating for Jewish and democratic values and supporting candidates and elected officials who share these values, such as Vice President Joe Biden. One year ago this past Saturday, Joe Biden launched his pres campaign for president with a reminder that President Trump equivocated in the face of white nationalists marching in Charlottesville and emboldened hatred targeting the Jewish community. Just yesterday, Joe Biden reminded us again that he would never equivocate in the face of hate. Marking one year since the horrific shooting at a synagogue in Poway, Vice President Biden proposed increasing funding to ensure Jewish institutions are secure, as well as increasing the penalty for anti-Semitic hate crimes, classifying them as acts of domestic terrorism, something that we at JDCA have been supporting and advocating since last year. This kind of leadership is exactly what JDCA has been calling for, and it's one of many reasons we are proud to stand with Joe Biden, because he stands with us. Several weeks ago, JDCA launched the Democrats Leading in Crisis call series to highlight democratic leadership amid our current crisis. We have brought together members of Congress, experts, and hundreds of you in eight calls over the past few weeks, and we're grateful to continue our conversation today by talking about the importance of leadership in the White House. At a time of great uncertainty for our country, there is one thing that is certain. We will hold the most important election of our lifetime in 189 days. Who we elect matters, and we're going to do everything we can to ensure that we elect Joe Biden as the next president of the United States. Today, we're going to hear from two leading Biden surrogates, the Honorable Senator Chris Coons and former Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken. Both Senator Coons and Tony will talk about Biden's policies and take your questions. Please send those questions to information or info, info at jewishdems.org. Info at jewishdems.org. We'll accumulate them and then we'll ask them to our guests at the end of the presentation. Finally, we want to invite you to join the conversation around this call on Twitter by tweeting us at US, Gems, US Jewish Dems at US Jewish Dems and using the hashtag Jewish Dems in action. Now I'm going to turn it over to JDCA Board Vice Chair Barbara Goldberg Goldman to introduce Senator Kuhn. Barbara? Thanks so much, Ron. As JDCA Board of Directors stated in our endorsement letter, the 2020 presidential election will determine the character and trajectory of our country. And for us, the choice could not be clearer. Americans are looking for unity amid crisis, and never before in our history have voters faced such a stark contrast in leadership. On the one hand, President Trump has repeatedly abdicated his responsibility to defend America's best interests and used hatred as a political tool. On the other hand, Joe Biden has demonstrated the ability to unify Americans and lead with responsibility, accountability, morality, empathy, and truth. We've all seen these defining aspects of Joe Biden's character during his decades of leadership, both in the Senate and in the Obama administration. And today we'll be joined by those who know him best, starting with Senator Chris Coons, who's representing the great state of Delaware and who, just like our Vice President Biden, takes the Amtrak from Wilmington to Washington every day. Since beginning elected in 2010, Senator Coons has established himself as a leading voice in the Democratic Party and the Senate. He serves on the Appropriations, Foreign Relations, Judiciary, and Ethics Committees. Senator Coons was the first Senator to endorse Joe Biden in April of 2019 with the following statement. Joe Biden doesn't just talk about making our country more just, he delivers results. And we at JDCA agree, and we are very excited to hear from Senator Coons today. But before we do, I'm going to turn this over to my dear friend and fellow JDCA board member, Michael Adler, 
to introduce to you Tony Blinken. Over to you, Michael. Okay, thanks, Barbara. And congratulations to you, Ron and Barbara, for the wonderful job that you've been doing providing leadership to the Jewish Democratic Council of America. And welcome everybody, especially Chris and Tony. Chris, I remember that day I got the call from Vice President Biden that you were gonna run for that seat that he certainly has uh, uh, in his heart because it certainly is not only his state, but as we know, Ted Kaufman succeeded you in that seat. And I have to tell you, it's been fabulous to see how you have grown and have become really a leader in the United States Senate, and especially a leader on our Jewish and pro-Israel issues. Thank you for all the work. As someone who has known Joe Biden for more than four decades, I know that when Joe speaks about issues impacting our community, especially anti-Semitism, he does it with empathy and humanity. It comes from his kishkas, as we know, his central core. As I said last week, when JDC announced its endorsement of Joe Biden, we're very fortunate that Joe Biden not only understands the issues of foreign policy, but he also understands the Jewish community in a very personal way. When it comes to foreign policy, no one has a larger and more important role advising the vice president than our guest and my good friend, Tony Blinken. I've worked with Tony for many years, and there is no question that there is a Biden-Blinken doctrine that we're all very proud of. Tony has held senior foreign policy positions in two administrations, most recently serving as Deputy Secretary of State in the Obama administration. Before his tenure at the State Department, Tony served in the White House as Assistant and Principal Deputy National Security Advisor to President Obama. Before that, he served as Deputy Assistant to the President National Security Advisor to Vice President Biden. Today, he is a senior foreign policy advisor to the Biden campaign. I will now turn it over to Senator Chris Coons and then to Tony. Following their remarks, JDC's executive director, Ellie Sofer, will moderate your question. Thank you and welcome, Senator Coons. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, and thank you so much uh, to Ron and to Barbara and everyone at JDCA for what you're doing. Uh, to Haley Seufer, who um, suffered through me ably uh, over four years on the Foreign Relations Committee uh, and has brought her immense talent and energy uh, to help JDCA rapidly become a force in American politics. Uh, and more than anything, thank you uh, to Tony Blinken. Uh, Tony and um, Evan Ryan, his wife, uh, have, decaded, have dedicated themselves to public service for decades. Uh, and he knows Joe as well as I do. I guess, Michael, you're probably the person on the call who has known Joe the longest. Um, I've only known him 30 years. You've probably known him 40. Uh, Tony having worked directly for him uh, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the White House, uh, I think has great insight and, and value to add to the debate because of Tony's experience and leadership in the State Department and the administration, and because of his very close role uh, in the Biden for President campaign uh, and uh, in the Obama Biden administration. Uh, let me talk just for a few minutes about this man uh, who we all know and love and support and who we are confident will be our next president uh, if we put our shoulders to the wheel uh, and if we double down and work harder than ever. Um, I know it is hard to believe in the middle of this pandemic uh, if you watch even 10 minutes uh, of President Trump's daily uh, briefings, uh, to call them that, it's hard to believe that there are still tens of millions of Americans who intend to work very hard for and to try and elect uh, Donald Trump to a second term. Uh, but those of us who've had a chance to actually see and work with uh, and be in close contact with Joe uh, know what a stark difference there is in terms of character, values, priority, gut, and action. Uh, I've known Joe because I grew up in Denver. He represented us uh, most of my life. I was actually an intern for him uh, when I was in law school on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and I served in county government, which is where he served before uh, being elected to the Senate in 1972. Um, and I was both uh, grateful and surprised to get a call from him in 2010 uh, urging me to run for his seat. Um, I was uh, grateful for his support in doing so. That led uh, me to you, Michael, and to a great event uh, Florida. Uh, in the decade I've served in the Senate, I have tried to follow 
my limited way I can in his footsteps in terms of values and priorities. What we know about this current moment is this. Um, Joe Biden has the plan to actually reach out to, connect, listen to, and care for uh, people who are affected, uh, whether it's by an economic downturn uh, or by an unexpected and a difficult health um, um, outcome, a diagnosis. Uh, I've seen him in person at campaign events and in community events here in Delaware uh, when he was senator and as vice president. Stop what he's doing. Listen very closely to someone. Connect with them. Give them his personal cell phone. And then not just that day for five or 10 minutes, but months later or years later, reconnect with them, stay in touch, help them um, to benefit from his own personal experience of what it means uh, to try and recover, to be knocked down by life, and then to get back up again. He knows that personally from his childhood experience of his dad losing his job and they're being forced to relocate here to Delaware. Uh, he knows that from his experience helping President Obama lead the Recovery Act um, and work with thousands of communities across our country to recover. And that gives him the depth of compassion, unlike our president who has to read his compassion off a teleprompter, um, Joe's is actually in his guts and in his experience and in his action. Really importantly, um, I got to work with uh, both Biden and Ron Klain in the Ebola uh, response of the Obama-Biden administration. And across several different pandemic responses, SARS and MERS and Ebola, um, Joe demonstrated that he understands what it means to listen to public health leaders, to respect science, uh, to step aside and to allow the experts to come up with a plan and then step back in and execute on it uh, with the sort of leadership we would hope for from a president. So um, let me just close on this. Uh, I know that Joe has the sorts of values, the sorts of justice oriented Torah values uh, that the Jewish Democratic Council of America is fighting for. I know that Joe in his gut hates people who abuse their power and would fight against anti-Semitism and would fight for the values of those of us uh, who are pro-Israel Democrats uh, that we long to see and hear coming out of our White House. So um, thank you for this endorsement today of Joe Biden. Thank you. You see clearly and what you're fighting for uh, now and in the 189 days left. Um, and I want to turn this over, if I can, to Tony, um, who's got a lot to say about what our country and our world would see differently with Joe Biden in leadership. Thank you. Senator, uh, thank you so, so much. Um, <laughs> I feel a little bit like Alan and Rossi. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, uh, Alan and Rossi were the, the group that followed the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. But uh, I'm gonna do my best. Um, it's um, always the greatest pleasure to share any platform, even a virtual one, with Senator Coons, one of uh, the vice president's closest friends, most trusted counselors and, and advisors. And um, you know, the vice president has a deep, deep, deep attachment to that, uh, that Senate seat in Delaware. And it's hard to think of um, anyone better uh, carrying on the mantle uh, in, in, uh, in Delaware and in our nation's capital um, than uh, Senator Coons. So it's, it's always great to be with you. Uh, and let me just say to the leadership of uh, JDCA, uh, to, to Barbara, uh, to Ron, to Haley, an old friend, and, and to an old friend too, Michael Adler, Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, this organization in a short period of time has become vital, increasingly vital, and no more so than as we head into this election for reasons we can, we can talk about in a minute. Uh, we are so grateful that you're there. We're so grateful to have uh, your support. And believe me, it's gonna be more important than ever in the six months ahead. Let me just speak a little bit to um, a little bit of history uh, and then fast forward into the, into the present. History, I think most of you know that Joe Biden's attachment uh, to Israel is long, strong, and deep. And it goes back to literally the first trip he took as a United States Senator, foreign trip, uh, in 1973, just before the Yom Kippur War, uh, to Israel. And he met a uh, prime minister by the name of Golda Meir, uh, who had a young aide uh, with her named Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, and there's one great moment from that that's always worth uh, uh, rehearsing, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard this before. Uh, this was just before the Yom Kippur War. There was uh, a huge tension in the air, and uh, a young Senator Biden was concerned for Israel's safety and, uh, and security. And he shared that concern with Prime Minister uh, Meir. And she 
pulled him aside and whispered to him, don't worry, we have a secret weapon. And he was wondering what that secret weapon could possibly be. And finally, she looked at him and she said, Senator, we have no place else to go. Uh, that was the start of a deep-rooted commitment to Israel's security that has carried uh, through the um, career of Vice President Biden, through the Senate, into the vice presidency, and now into, uh, into this campaign. At every critical juncture point in Israel's history and in its relationship with the United States, Joe Biden has been there, uh, supporting Israel, supporting its security, supporting the relationship between our countries. Um, there's other history here that's really important because it tends to get discounted or forgotten uh, or ignored. And that's the rather extraordinary track record of the Obama-Biden administration when it comes to the relationship uh, with Israel and Israel's security. Uh, even Prime Minister Netanyahu said at one point during the administration uh, that no administration had done more for Israel's security than the Obama-Biden administration. And I appreciate the Prime Minister saying that. You all know the record, but it's important to re repeat it and to remind ourselves of it. Uh, the deepest military to military and intelligence to intelligence ties of any time, uh, more exercises, more communications, more shared uh, information than ever before. Uh, remarkable support for the very systems that have saved lives again and again and again, starting with Iron Dome, uh, but also other uh, systems, David Sling, uh, the Arrow 3, um, all of this during the Obama-Biden administration. An unprecedented memorandum of understanding, $38 billion in, in uh, uh, security assistance over 10 years, the largest military aid package in the history of the United States. The vice president was a driving force in all of these and in more, standing against efforts to delegitimize Israel in international organizations at the United Nations uh, and other places, standing against the boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, movement, uh, constantly standing up for Israel and working harder than ever to advance uh, what I believe we all share as a goal, uh, a two-state solution that preserves Israel in security and as a democratic and Jewish state. So that record is really important to remind ourselves of because uh, our friends on the other side uh, lie about it on a regular basis. And uh, we need to uh, constantly be reminding all of our friends in the community of that record. Going forward, um, if Joe Biden's elected president, I can tell you this, he will sustain and he will build on the relationship and the foundation of that relationship, our security partnership. Um, that is a guarantee. Uh, he will work hard to advance the idea uh, and the reality of a two-state uh, solution, urging both sides to take the necessary steps to bring that possibility back to life and then hopefully and ultimately to really advance it. Uh, he'll continue to stand against things like the uh, BDS movement. Uh, he will uh, reverse efforts to make Israel a partisan political football. One of the most negative things I think we've seen in recent years are attempts uh, primarily by some of our Republican friends to do just that. Nothing could be worse for Israel. Nothing could be worse for the United States. That would stop under a Biden administration. And I think you'll see other things too, working to expand even more collaborations in many different areas, including science and technology. Israel as a startup nation is and should be even more of a great partner for the United States. Finally, let me say this, and then we can get to a conversation and questions. Um, you heard this from, uh, from Ron and from, from others. Um, there's a, a reason that Vice President Biden got into this race. Um, it was, he was on the fence about it. But what really pushed him over and made the decision to run the only decision he could make was Charlottesville. And you all remember what we saw in Charlottesville. Uh, we saw uh, people coming out and chanting the very same anti-Semitic bile that the world had heard uh, a half century before uh, in Germany the same kinds of words uh, and this combination of anti-Semitism and racism that was on display there uh, was one of the ugliest things we've seen in recent times. But as bad, of course, was President Trump's reaction, equating the people who were shouting and uh, marching in this vile way with the people who were standing against them, drawing a moral equivalence, very fine people on both sides. That, is, that was the hinge moment for Joe Biden and getting into uh, this race. We've seen an upsurge, as you know, in uh, anti-Semitic attacks uh, across the country and uh, bigoted attacks of all kinds against uh, LGBT, uh, against Muslims, 
against churches. Um, and honestly, uh, the dog whistles, the tropes, uh, the words that we've heard out of this administration and this president are only encouraging that kind uh, of atmosphere. And uh, that's something that a Biden administration will stand resolutely against. Um, and finally, across the board, I think that if you're looking at the platform that he's bringing to this election, to this campaign, and the platform he would bring to the presidency, it really is one that is almost totally coincident with the values of the community that I'm very proud to be part of, the Jewish community. Um, equality, dignity, tolerance, these are all animating principles uh, that unite us. Civil rights, women's rights, equal pay, and a, an incredibly progressive platform when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to education, when it comes to dealing with climate. All of these things, I think, are very coincident with the vast majority uh, of views in the Jewish American community. So the candidate uh, is our candidate. But as Chris said, as uh, others have said, this is going to be the battle of a lifetime. We always say before an election, this is the most important election of my lifetime. I think it's actually fair to say that this is literally the most important election of our lifetimes. And it is going to be one of the hardest fought and possibly one of the nastiest and of course, happening in an environment that is totally novel. So it's gonna require each and every one of us to be out there every single day, especially exercising the remarkable networks that uh, all of you have um, in organizing, uh, in pushing back politically, in raising funds, um, in bringing ideas forward. All of that is more important than it's ever been. We're so grateful to have you as allies and partners in this fight. Let me stop there. Great, thank you so much, Senator Coons and Tony for being here today with us. We've received quite a few of your questions. I'm trying to group them by topic. Uh, we will start by uh, focusing on the election. This is going to be the most important election of our lifetime that will determine the trajectory of our country's future and the character of our nation. And many of our supporters are concerned about their right to vote in this election. As we saw just a few weeks ago in Wisconsin, some Republicans are uh, trying to force us to have to choose between our health and our right to vote. And several uh, of our supporters, including Denise from, from Massachusetts and Ira from Maryland, have asked about vote by mail. Uh, Senator Coons, we know you have been considering additional funding for vote by mail in Congress. And there are questions about what we can do to ensure that every American has the right to vote by mail in November, especially given President Trump's efforts to defund the US Postal Service. And for you, Tony, we have a question from 15-year-old Matan Berg. How does the Biden campaign view New York's decision to cancel their presidential primary? So lots of concerns about our right to vote, including from even Matan, who is not quite the age to vote, but can still help to get Biden elected. So we'll start with you, Senator Coons. And thanks, Kelly, and thanks for the question. Um, I have worked closely with Senators Wyden and Klobuchar uh, on a bill that is endorsed by virtually Democrat in the Senate um, that would significantly expand um, the right to vote uh, in requiring states to have 20 days uh, to vote by mail before the November election, requiring all states to have no fall absentee ballots. Um, as you may know, there are five states that now conduct uh, all elections by mail virtually. There's five more that have no fault uh, vote by mail. Uh, but the other 40, frankly, have a wide range of practices, uh, most of which make it quite difficult to vote by mail. Uh, we did manage to get $400 million uh, into the CARES Act, uh, the largest of the four so far uh, stimulus packages. And I'm the ranking member, the, the highest Democrat on the appropriations subcommittee that funds our elections. Uh, we have had year after year fights uh, over improving access uh, to the right to vote. Um, I'm leading uh, an effort to try and get $3.6 billion into our next stimulus uh, package in partnership with Senator Klobuchar. Uh, but I expect Republicans to fight this very hard. Let me just remind you of two other uh, facts, if I could. Um, President Trump is going to be voting absentee. Uh, he has already uh, requested an absentee ballot from Florida, his now state of residency. And three to 400,000 American troops, diplomats, and development professionals 
uh, vote by mail from overseas in every single election. Um, so I don't put a lot of stock in the complaints and concerns uh, raised by some of my Republican colleagues that this is uh, somehow a secret um, scheme to allow voter fraud. In reality, there have been very few cases ever proven of voter fraud, and there are ways to track uh, vote by mail ballots and to certify signatures. Uh, and frankly, I am concerned about the defunding of the post office uh, and our postal system as a way to make it even harder for people to vote by mail. As Haley mentioned in the question, um, there are seven cases of COVID positive people who um, were likely infected in exercising their constitutionally central right to vote in Wisconsin. We should be providing for a safe and secure way for those uh, who are uh, particularly vulnerable uh, to COVID-19 to exercise their right to vote this November and your help amplifying this message would be greatly appreciated. So just to add a couple of, uh, of things to, to Senator Coons, um, look, uh, governors have to make these uh, decisions or the state legislatures have to make these decisions when it comes to the, uh, uh, the primaries. And of course, with uh, the vice president as the presumptive nominee, uh, we're in a slightly different place than we were say on, on Super Tuesday. But let me point out something else. Um, South Korea recently held national elections about 10 days ago. And it was quite remarkable. They had turnout that I think was the highest that they'd had in, uh, in years, uh, close to 70%. Uh, the election went forward democratically and it went forward safely. And the reason for that is they took the necessary steps to ensure that both could happen. Uh, they made sure that there was um, more uh, right in voting. Uh, they made sure that there was more early voting and they made sure that the polling places themselves uh, were safe with the appropriate social distancing uh, and uh, sanitary standards. And it went remarkably well. Uh, it's, it's doable, more than doable. Uh, and our election is six months away. What we really should be seeing now is an effort led by the President of the United States uh, and others to make sure that our elections go forward democratically and safely um, in November. And the steps that could be taken now uh, would easily, uh, I think, ensure that, uh, barring some uh, you know, very different turn of, uh, of the virus as bad as it is. Um, and of course, we're not seeing that from the president. Um, I wish and hope uh, that, uh, uh, that we will. Meanwhile, though, uh, happily, uh, this is ultimately the responsibility at, uh, at a state level. Uh, we should be getting federal assistance, federal help, but in, the, in its absence, there are many steps that states can take to make sure that uh, the voting goes forward uh, in that way. So I hope we see a program designed to make sure that there is as much early voting as possible. It's stretched out uh, as long as uh, reasonable, that uh, mail-in voting uh, can be done effectively. I, I would just add, you know, part of the challenge with mail-in voting is that one, you have to get people used to it. In some places they are, in other places they're not. Um, second, in most places you have to affirmatively requ uh, request a ballot. Uh, that's tricky. So you've got, got to get the information out and people have to make sure they make the request. Uh, and in some places they have to put their own stamp on it. Uh, little things though make, uh, make a difference. And in most places that aren't used to having a big volume of mail-in voting, you would have to make sure that the infrastructure and processes in place to count uh, mail-in votes when they're going to be, you know, 80% of the vote instead of 20%. So all of that is very, very doable, but we should be starting now, not uh, say uh, the first week in November. Great. Our next set of questions uh, relates to anti-Semitism. Tony, as you noted at the outset, uh, Vice President Biden began his uh, campaign by talking about Charlottesville and the horrific scene of neo-Nazis marching in our streets and the president who equated them with those peacefully protesting them. Just yesterday, uh, Joe Biden announced that if elected president, he would take additional measures to add protections for the Jewish community and others who have been the target of the rising white nationalism and hatred we have seen. Uh, we, have, we have questions about what that proposal entails. Uh, Tony, if you don't mind explaining sure. what steps Joe Biden would take to ensure our community and others would be protected from the rise of white nationalism. And Senator Coons, if you could also speak to uh, the rise of anti-Semitism we have seen in our country and knowing Joe Biden as you do, uh, what approach you, you believe he would take as president to address this issue. Uh, Haley, thanks very much, and thanks for the great, uh, the great question. Yeah, as we were talking about just a, a short while ago, we have seen this historic increase in hate crimes, uh, targeting Jews, but again, also targeting 
of people of color, the LGBT community, uh, Muslims, and uh, in, in my judgment at least, aided and abetted by some of the dog whistles and tropes that you're hearing from uh, the president. Any uh, uh, hate crime uh, is, is horrific, but there's something particularly uh, egregious about attacks that take places on houses of worship, places of worship. Um, and that, of course, is what we've, uh, what we've seen. And there is something about the sanctity uh, of such a place uh, that people go there um, believing that they will be in safety and have a refuge. I think basically uh, the two things that strike us most deeply are these attacks on uh, places of worship and schools uh, for, for, for obvious reasons. Two things from Joe Biden. One is you've probably heard him say, silence is complicity. Um, we need to speak out, we need to speak up, and that starts with the President of the United States. Uh, and believe me, Joe Biden as President uh, would not be silent when it comes uh, to hate crimes in, in, in general and to attacks on places of worship in particular. But besides speaking up and speaking out, we also need to act. And so you rightly pointed out that just yesterday, uh, the Vice President put forward a plan to safeguard places of worship. And there are three basic components to that. And I would invite people to go to the website, joebiden.com. This is laid out in great detail. Um, one is increasing uh, security grants to, uh, uh, to communities to make sure that uh, they can adequately uh, protect in conjunction with uh, law enforcement uh, and others, uh, their places of worship. Uh, we've seen the, the, the budget uh, decrease uh, for these grants. Uh, Joe Biden would significantly increase it. There's been a huge demand uh, from communities for this uh, that far exceeds what's in the existing budget. Second, um, we would have a faith-based law enforcement process so that within the Department of Justice, uh, we would have an office with the right tools and the right training to focus on uh, preventing these kinds uh, of attacks. And finally, um, as has been noted, uh, a Biden administration would very, very vigorously prosecute uh, hate crimes and again, uh, as we mentioned a few moments ago, consider them acts of domestic terrorism. So you put all that together and you have hopefully a program that uh, can prevent, uh, mitigate, and if necessary, unfortunately, respond in a way that maybe deters future attacks. Uh, that's at the heart of what the vice president would do. Thank you, Tony. Let me just add briefly that I would expect uh, a President Biden um, to, to not just um, refuse to engage in the sorts of uh, winks, nods, smiles, dog whistles at uh, hatred and anti-Semitism that we have at times uh, seen from President Trump, um, that he would not just stand in solidarity with the um, affirmative and thorough agenda that uh, Tony just laid out, but that on the world stage, uh, he would push back on anti-Semitism. Um, tragically, we've seen too many countries in Europe forget uh, the lessons of the evil of the Shoah, uh, and whether it's in Hungary or Poland, whether it's in the Nordic states or in Western Europe, uh, we've seen a shocking rise in public displays of anti-Semitism, uh, in some cases on the part of government leaders, in many cases uh, on uh, in demonstrations or acts of violence uh, by uh, marginal uh, leaders or even domestic terrorists. So um, leading a global campaign against anti-Semitism uh, naming it for what it is, um, providing the resources and the, the moral leadership uh, globally around religious freedom and around the ability for um, people to practice um, their faith without fear uh, and to live as, as full and respected and engaged members of their community around the world is something I would expect to see and hear from a President Biden, but in particular, to be forceful and persistent and engaged in combating anti-Semitism globally um, and showing that commitment here at home. Great, well, we've received quite a few questions related to foreign policy. Uh, we'll start with some of the general ones and then get more specific. Um, so the first question comes from Jason Birkin, who is one of our JDCA campus fellows at the University of Miami. This question is, would a Biden administration have a different foreign policy approach than President Obama? And then from there, we have a few questions on Iran. Uh, Richard Goldstein has asked uh, a question specifically uh, about the JCPOA. 
Some of us on this call oppose the JCPOA, but also oppose President Trump's unilateral withdrawal, withdrawal from the agreement without a cogent plan forward to deal with Iran. What should we expect from a Biden administration as it relates to Iran's nuclear ambitions and their continued malign activities around the world? And then finally, the last question on Iran, and we'll pause there, is um, from Steve in Illinois. Secretary of State Pompeo says he wants to snap back sanctions pursuant to the Iran deal, but we withdrew from the Iran deal <laughs> last year. Does that make any sense? So three questions on foreign policy, one, two on uh, JCPOA, and from there we'll get into Israel, but we'll pause, uh, we'll pause to hear from both of you. Senator, how do you want to do this? <laughs> Um, Tony, I'm happy to defer to you on the question uh, more broadly uh, or more specifically, whichever one you choose. Well, let me, let me kick it off and then, and then hand the ball to you, uh, which uh, will be much needed by the time I get done. Um, well, let me actually go backward. Um, yeah, I love the last question because, um, boy, it's, it's hard not to um, almost admire uh, the sheer uh, hypocrisy uh, of the action that the administration is trying to take in seeking to, um, uh, in effect, force uh, countries at the, uh, at the Security Council to um, find a way to extend the arms embargo uh, on, uh, on Iran, which, as you know, uh, we managed to get extended, actually, as part of the JCPOA. Uh, it was part and parcel of all of the sanctions that had been levied against Iran, um, and uh, the Iranians, of course, wanted it lifted as part of the JCPOA, we got it extended for five years. It is now coming to expiry. And the administration is citing its status as a participant in the JCPOA, which of course the United States once was, giving it uh, the right to um, in effect snap back sanctions. Uh, and I won't go into the, uh, the mind numbing details, but basically if you have a, um, a veto on the Security Council, uh, this is what we designed into the uh, Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, you can, um, in effect, uh, unilaterally get that, get that done. They're trying to use this um, provision in the JCPOA uh, to uh, require the uh, extension of the, uh, of the arms embargo. The only problem is we are no longer a participant in the agreement. In fact, the statement by which the White House pulled out of the agreement, I think, was, was titled at the time, uh, the United States end is ending its participation in the JCPOA. So, that would seem to be a little bit of a legal non-starter, but we'll see how it, uh, how it plays out. Let me just say on the JCPOA more generally. Uh, look, uh, I was uh, part and parcel of getting that uh, uh, agreement uh, negotiated uh, and finalized. Uh, I still believe it's one of the greatest achievements of the uh, Obama-Biden uh, administration. I know, however, that uh, other people uh, disagree with that. I very much respect concerns um, that uh, people raised about the agreement. No agreement, no negotiation gives you 100% of what you want. But as Joe Biden likes to say, uh, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And without rehearsing this in, in, in great detail, the facts are basically these. Uh, what we inherited was an Iran that was racing toward the capacity to develop fissile material on very short notice for a nuclear weapon. And the so-called breakout time was coming down from months to potentially weeks. And so we had to decide what to do about it. And we looked very hard at all of the different courses of action that were possible, including military action. And ultimately, we decided that the most effective way to curb Iran's nuclear program was to, get, was to force them, in effect, to come back to the negotiating table and negotiate an agreement. And we did that in part by President Obama and Vice President Biden going around the world and getting other uh, countries to levy sanctions on Iran that they had refused in the past uh, to do. And part of the premise of that was that uh, these countries didn't like the idea of, um, of the sanctions, but they accepted them because they believed that the purpose of the sanctions was to find a diplomatic negotiated outcome. And that was something they could accept. And so we built on uh, sa domestic sanctions that had been put in place by the Bush administration to build the most comprehensive international sanctions on Iran. And ultimately we got it back to the table. We negotiated agree an agreement, an agreement that gave us extraordinary access uh, to uh, Iran's uh, nuclear facilities uh, with the most intrus intrusive inspections regime in arms control history. Uh, requirements and obligations on the part of Iran, some of which sunsetted, but many of which uh, lasted many, many, many uh, years, and some indefinitely, including uh, its um, uh, commitment not to develop a nuclear weapon. And 
the agreement was being adhered to. Our intelligence community said so. International inspectors uh, said so. And of course, uh, as uh, your question very rightly noted, even for those who didn't like the agreement, pulling out with no plan B in place was, I think, one of the worst mistakes that this administration has made. Let me just conclude that by saying this. The administration said in pulling out that it would accomplish two things. It would, uh, at pulling out and then exerting what it called maximum pressure on Iran. It would force Iran back to the table to negotiate what they called a better agreement, and it would curb Iran's malign activities in the region, including those directed against Israel. But as many uh, predicted at the time, not only did that not happen, just the opposite has happened. Iran has started to resume some of the dangerous aspects of its nuclear program, and it is now a more active and malignant actor in the region uh, than it's been uh, and than it was during the pendency of the nuclear agreement. Uh, so this has turned out to be a grievous, grievous mistake. If there is a, uh, a Biden administration, um, what I can tell you is this, uh, if, and a big if, Iran were to come back into compliance with its obligations on the agreement, uh, we would do the same thing. But then we would use that as a platform, a launching pad, a foundation to uh, look to make the agreement stronger and longer. And at the same time, this would have an added benefit. What President Trump has managed to do is divide us from our allies and put us in a situation where we're isolated, having pulled out of the agreement unilaterally, not Iran. And as a result, efforts that need to be made together to push back against Iran's malign actions and activities throughout the region, it's not happening. And other countries, including our closest partners, spend more time complaining about us than acting against Iran. If we're in a place where we're back in the agreement and trying to build it longer and stronger, uh, we would also be able to secure much more cooperation in pushing back against Iran's actions uh, that we don't like. Let me stop there and turn it over to Senator Coons. Um, well, thank you, Tony, for laying out the whole arc and scope uh, of both the important developments that led to the JCPOA and what the conditions and terms would be for moving forward. And uh, I'll just conclude because I know uh, we only have about uh, 15 minutes left uh, by answering what was the broader framing question, how would uh, a Biden uh, foreign policy be different? And I'll say from a Trump foreign policy and an Obama foreign policy uh, first, it would build on Obama's foreign policy successes, but be informed uh, by the challenges. Uh, I would say the increased dangers that have resulted from four years of President Trump separating us and distancing us uh, from some of our closest allies uh, in a whole series of meetings and conversations with the ambassadors and the foreign ministers uh, from uh, Germany, from France, from Great Britain. Uh, it is painfully clear to me the ways in which uh, the abrupt departure from the JCPOA uh, without seriously considering an alternative path that our European partners were trying to um, open for us um, has left a lasting mark. So too has the squabbling over NATO contributions. So too has our withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, so too has the, I think, uh, terrible um, mistake of imposing national security justified uh, trade um, sanctions on, uh, excuse me, additional tariffs on some of our closest partners, uh, whether it's uh, Canada uh, or the Nordic states uh, or our core European partners. So uh, my hope and expectation would be that a Biden foreign policy uh, would be informed by the lessons of the last few years um, and would focus immediately on uh, strengthening and restoring and renewing some of the most important ties we've got uh, in the Indo-Pacific as well as in Europe uh, and in North America. Uh, and then in mobilizing the world, leading the world, first in the response and recovery uh, from this pandemic, next in confronting some of the existential threats that face our world, like climate change, um, and in stepping up uh, to both uh, confront, um, compete with, and partner with China in a way that uh, respects its role as a peer competitor uh, in this century. Um, there have been so many different ways in which Trump's foreign policy with regards to all of these challenges um, has not, in fact, made us safer and more secure. Uh, and given the unique recent developments in the oil markets, uh, I do think we have a moment of opportunity, uh, in particular with regards to Iran, uh, which because of the near collapse in the price of oil um, is I think temporarily at least in a place where we really could quickly and aggressively reopen negotiations towards a stronger and broader agreement uh, that a Biden administration would be uniquely positioned to be able to bring to a successful conclusion. 
Thank you. Well, continuing our theme of foreign policy, we've received quite a few questions with regard to Israel, and I'll continue to try to group them together thematically. Um, so we'll start with uh, a question from Blake Goodman. Vice President Biden has long supported unconditional aid to Israel, understanding how Israel's defense needs are paramount. Would that remain the policy in his administration, regardless of which party or who is prime minister in Israel? Yes. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Blake got a clear answer to that question. Uh, we've also had several questions, uh, including from Susie in New Jersey, Les in Atlanta, and Karen in New York, about whether uh, Vice President Biden, as president, would keep the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. You, uh, let, me, let me start there. Um, and the short answer is uh, yes. At this point, um, revisiting that question, uh, does not make a lot of sense, uh, either practically or for that matter, uh, politically. Uh, the real question going forward is, uh, what can be done to try to revive and then ultimately advance the prospects of two states for two people? Um, and that is where we would try to take uh, the conversation. That's where we try to take the focus. And there's a profoundly basic and important reason for that, uh, for those of us who are strong, uh, pro-Israel Democrats and strong pro-Israel Americans. If you believe, as I think all of us do, that we want a future for Israel that is secure, democratic, and Jewish, the only way to really assure that is through uh, two states. And in many ways, um, pulling the plug on a two-state uh, solution is pulling the plug potentially on an Israel that is not only secure, but is Jewish and democratic uh, for the future. That's not something any of us uh, who are ardent supporters of Israel uh, would wanna see. And that's why it is so vital that we try to find ways to get back to um, a place where in the first instance, steps are not being taken that make what is already incredibly difficult, uh, virtually impossible. Uh, and that ultimately uh, some new foundation is built upon which uh, we can actually build toward uh, two states. Uh, I'm not minimizing how incredibly difficult that would be. Right now, we're heading in exactly the opposite direction. That's bad for Israel. Frankly, if I could, just to follow up on that, uh, I have grave concerns about the consequences of an annexation of um, settlements in the West Bank and what that would mean, both in terms of um, shutting the door on the viability of a two-state solution uh, and further straining Israel's limited security resources um, if there is additional territory to be um, secured in advance of there being any final uh, resolution. Um, I, I think, uh, as Tony has just said, that um, making it possible for there to be a pathway towards a two-state solution remains essential to the U.S.-Israel relationship uh, and to the future uh, of an Israel that we can all um, see and respect as a democratic state and a Jewish homeland. Great. Um, you've anticipated some of our next questions because they're all about annexation. Uh, so I will, I will summarize. Um, uh, we have a question from both Jonathan Jacoby and, uh, in Los Angeles and Michael Gelman in Maryland. Uh, how does Vice President Biden view the Israeli government's decision to move forward this summer with partial annexation of the West Bank? Is it a game changer? And how might a Biden administration respond to this development if it occurs? I will also add that Bryant Harris at Al Monitor and uh, Jacob Kornblue at Jewish Insider have also asked about uh, Biden's position with regard to annexation. And we are wondering specifically uh, about how a Biden administration might respond to this development. So what the vice president has said, uh, and he's, he's on the record several times on this um, in recent months in the course of this campaign, is that uh, any unilateral step taken by either side that makes the prospect of a negotiated two-state uh, two outcome uh, less likely uh, is something he opposes, and that includes uh, annexation. Um, and for the reasons that uh, Senator Coons and I just, uh, just discussed, we believe that that two-state outcome is vital to Israel's future as a secure Jewish and democratic state. And so actions that make that even less likely uh, simply don't make sense. And that's why 
the vice president has been uh, clearly opposed to uh, annexation. Uh, I'm not going to prejudge uh, what we might do or not do in uh, the context of a Biden administration. I think you'd really have to see uh, exact where things stood at the time. Uh, lots of things can happen uh, between now and then, uh, and I don't want to prejudge where we'll, where we'll be. Uh, but uh, again, what I can say very clearly, because he said it uh, repeatedly, is that uh, he would oppose the, uh, the move toward annexation. Uh, my hope would be that Ashkenazi is foreign minister and Gantz is defense minister in what will be internal deliberations, um, given their deep experience in the IDF and um, given the security consequences of an abrupt move, um, would, would caution uh, Bibi against some um, significant step like this. Uh, but, you know, look, as Tony says, uh, it's hard to exactly prejudge the circumstances on the ground um, as of January of next year, and uh, we only have one president at a time. So um, it is important, at least for me as a serving member of the Foreign Relations Committee, um, to express my views clearly and strongly, but to also uh, be measured about uh, putting any constraints on what a Biden administration would look like. Great. Uh, moving back to domestic policy, uh, we have a question from Lynn. Uh, Radoff on the Supreme Court. Uh, Senator Coons, you have been in the Senate now for 10 years. You have uh, <laughs> been there for a confirmation of Supreme Court justices, uh, as well as um, many, uh, and, and especially in the past few years, uh, you know, federal court appointments. Can you speak to uh, what it's been like to be in the Senate uh, as, as we've seen these confirmations go through, uh, over 50 of them, I believe, in the past two years uh, to the circuit court, and uh, what the Supreme Court might look like uh, with uh, a President Biden? Uh, well, the Supreme Court under President Biden would look fundamentally different uh, than it looks today, and then it will look with another Trump administration term. Uh, we were literally just uh, on a caucus a call earlier today uh, vigorously debating um, the plan apparently uh, by Majority Leader McConnell to pull us all back uh, into session in violation of the stay-at-home order in the District of Columbia and in most of our states um, simply to advance the nomination of an unqualified uh, very young uh, district court judge who's been nominated uh, for a circuit court seat. Um, Senator McConnell has been unrelenting in his determination to fill as many seats as is humanly possible, um, given the uh, potential outcome of a loss of the Senate majority, although that will take a great deal of work and a decent amount of luck uh, this fall. It is possible, and it would end this headlong rush uh, towards not just the politicization of our federal courts at all levels, uh, but the enshrinement of very conservative legal principles um, as someone who serves on the Judiciary Committee and was present for and actively engaged in and ultimately opposed to the confirmations of both uh, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh, uh, I'll tell you that it was a harrowing process where um, a lot of longstanding norms in terms of how the committee conducts itself and its business, um, the respect and deference between members and the process we followed uh, were further battered. Um, I've known um, Justice Kavanaugh for a very long time. We went to law school. Uh, at roughly the same time, and he clerked here in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, on the Third Circuit, as did I. Um, and I've known uh, Justice Gorsuch uh, since we were Truman scholars. Uh, and they are very bright men, um, very conservative men. And um, in both cases, I voted against them principally because of uh, things in their writings, things in their uh, public pronouncements, things that they refuse to be fully, uh, I think, uh, responsive uh, about publicly in terms of their views on religious liberty uh, and on um, executive power. Uh, and I think if there is a second Trump administration, um, you will see another series of Supreme Court justices who will permanently bend the arc uh, of our legal future um, in a direction that would be more conservative than at any point since the court in the 1920s. Um, so I know uh, many of the folks in the Democratic base around the country don't quite see yet clearly just how bad this can and will get. Um, but I'll tell you, as someone who sits there week in and week out uh, fighting with the majority over who they're putting on federal benches uh, all over the country, the consequences of this will be lasting and significant. Great. And 
For our last questions, uh, again, I'm trying to get to as many as possible, and we, we've never had as many questions as, we, as we've received on this call, so, so thank you uh, for everyone to send in questions. Uh, we'll do two questions here, starting with Marilyn from California. I live in a very blue state with a prominent Jewish Democratic member of Congress. How can I best use my voice to support the issues you are discussing and ensure that Democrats are elected in swing states beyond California. And then we have our final question from Mishulam Unger, a student at Brandeis. As an incoming college student who has helped found Brandeis for Biden, I'm worried about the lack of online content by Biden and his supporters as opposed to Trump and the right-wing ecosystem. What can we as college students do to get the message out and to help elect Joe Biden in November? Uh, great. I'm happy to start. And, uh, and those are really great questions. And they sort of cut to the heart of things. Um, for those who are in blue states and want to help, uh, there are a bunch of ways you can do that. Um, one is actually uh, contribute, because right now, we're um, playing catch up in a major way. Uh, President Trump has a huge war chest. Um, we have the challenge of trying to build our own at a time when we can't do traditional fundraising events. Um, we're doing a lot of virtual events um, that are going well. Uh, and we have a very uh, active and, and successful online fundraising program, but um, there's a lot of ground to catch up. So we really need that help. But beyond that, um, I would again invite you to go to the, uh, the website, joebiden.com. Uh, to take a look because there are very important ways to engage in the campaign no matter where you are in ways that can have an impact well beyond where you are. Uh, everything from uh, text message banking to old-fashioned old uh, phone banking, all of that uh, is there. The organizational piece of this could not be more important because we can't do some of the traditional uh, shoe leather on the ground kind of uh, organizing. So uh, please do go to the website, check it out. There are great ways to volunteer great ways to make your voice uh, heard and felt beyond whichever state you happen to be in. But the other thing I'd say is so many of you have remarkable networks of family, uh, friends, uh, work colleagues that transcend the borders of, uh, of your state. Exercise those networks. Be in touch with people. Share information. Push back against the extraordinary misinformation that's out there almost every second uh, about Joe Biden and about our campaign. Uh, there are lots of ways to do that. Um, there are also efforts uh, that, that Senator Coons was talking about before to get involved uh, with organizations that are helping make sure that we can vote safely and democratically in uh, November. So I'd invite you to try to find some of those organizations as well. To the really great question um, about college students, look, this is something uh, we care deeply about. And the good news, <laughs> in a sense, is that uh, it's bad, horrific news for the country, but um, some people have a little bit more time on their hands now than they otherwise would because of the uh, tragedy that we're living as a, as a country, uh, starting with, uh, with college students. There are ways, again, on the, uh, the website uh, to uh, get organized virtually, to have an impact, to have your voice heard. Um, and then the power of some uh, grassroots work should never be underestimated. I would say in one thing in conclusion before turning it over to Senator Coons for the last word, especially for the younger folks, if you look at the platform that Vice President Biden is bringing to this election, um, it is, I think, safe to say, across the board, uh, the most uh, practically progressive platform any Democratic nominee will bring to uh, the general election. Whether it's healthcare, whether it is education, uh, whether it's climate change, whether it's taxation, um, these are plans and programs that would, in a very powerful way, move the country forward. And uh, while some of our you know, uh, younger friends in particular uh, may have been very attracted to some of the planks and platforms in, uh, in other uh, campaigns, including Senator Sanders or Senator Warren, um, we're grateful uh, to have their support. And beyond that, I really would invite you to invite your friends who may feel that way to look at what we're actually proposing. And even if some of it doesn't go as far as uh, some of your uh, friends would like. Uh, as Senator Coons was saying, you know, this is not happening in a vacuum. Uh, uh, look at what the alternative is. Uh, we can have a president who moves the country forward in a progressive way, but also in a practical way uh, with um, things that are actually achievable politically, because at the end of the day, 
uh, you can have the most uh, you know, wonderfully progressive platform in the world. If you can't get any of it done, it doesn't get you anywhere. We believe we have a platform that really can uh, get done and move the country forward. We know what the alternative is. Um, we, uh, we didn't know almost four years ago uh, when President Trump was elected. We've now had the very hard experience of three and a half years of his administration. So the alternative couldn't be starker and young voices are more important than ever. Uh, and so those of you who believe in this effort, please do whatever you can to encourage your friends, uh, to, to bring them in, uh, to show them what we would actually do to move the country forward. Um, thank you, Tony, for those compelling words. I agree with you. And uh, I'm tempted to simply say ditto. Uh, but let me just briefly add, uh, my own daughter, uh, who's an NYU student, is working tirelessly uh, with a group of college students across five different campuses. Um, and you should be able to connect with Tony or me if you're looking for uh, a surrogate, a direct connection to the campaign, uh, for help with organizing and outreach. Uh, but frankly, your voice is as important, if not more important than ours. We don't know exactly how to get digital outreach and connecting to college students, right? So feel free to suggest things, to develop and post original content. To the point Tony was just making, um, it's important that young people recognize um, that Joe Biden actually has one of the most progressive records in Senate history, not just of giving great speeches or laying out plans, but of actually getting things done in healthcare, in climate change, in marriage equality, in promoting human rights and peace globally. Um, I would put his record next to any of my colleagues in the Senate and say in terms of actual accomplishments, things that have happened, that are law, that have affected the lives of millions of people, uh, Joe Biden has the most progressive actual accomplishment record any one of the candidates who stood for president this time um, and is someone who delights in and engages with and will listen to um, the younger people of this country. Um, one other thing I'll mention, there's a lot of focus on exactly who he's going to pick to be his running mate as vice president. It's important that we open our aperture a little bit and look at who will be in his cabinet, who he will put on the Supreme Court, and who will be his running mate. Because if all we do is make this a high stakes game over that one pick, we miss the arc. Um, so for example, if Stacey Abrams isn't his vice presidential running mate, she may well end up being a, a Supreme Court nominee or attorney general. If, if Elizabeth Warren isn't his vice presidential running mate, she may well end up in the cabinet in one of the most powerful or significant positions. So recognize that there is a wide range of folks from Mayor Pete Buttigieg, um, whose a profile went from being a mayor of a relatively obscure city in Indiana to being one of the most competent and capable presidential candidates um, to my own uh, seatmate in the Senate, Amy Klobuchar, uh, whose famous launch in the middle of a snowstorm uh, to her joining Joe um, in the night before Super Tuesday uh, made such a big change in this campaign. There is a wide range of promising, capable, younger Democrats from whom Joe will pick his cabinet uh, and his um, Supreme Court picks uh, and his running mate. So uh, my hope, uh, Marilyn, if I could, in closing, uh, is that you'll recognize the wisdom in what Tony just said. People vote mostly because of what they hear from someone they know and trust. Um, I've got a good friend. Uh, we went to graduate school together in California. Um, she wasn't on the Joe Biden bandwagon initially. It was Mayor Pete who was her pick. But ever since Mayor Buttigieg endorsed Joe Biden, she has made 50 phone calls a day <laughs> to friends, to classmates, to neighbors, to people she knows through a variety of ways. She's in California, but she's making calls into Pennsylvania, into Ohio, into Wisconsin in a disciplined and thorough way every single day. Maybe not all of us have the courage or determination to make 50 calls a day, but if you made 10 or five, those individual outreaches to people you know or who are friends of friends, that testimony and that engagement can actually matter. That's what moves the needle more than anything else is a personal contact from someone who knows you and who you know. So thank you to everybody. Um, thank you to um, the Jewish Democratic Council of America for this important endorsement. And Tony, thank you for everything you're doing um, to help take all that experience and all those values that you and Joe shared as part of the Obama Biden administration and to lay out a compelling plan for how our country and our world would be better with Joe Biden in the White House. 
What a powerful way to close this, uh, this session. I'd like to thank both Senator Coons and Tony for sharing their perspective and insight. And thank all of you for joining our eighth call and our Democrats leading in crisis call series. I wanna remind everybody to please look to jewishdems.org, look us up, jewishdems.org, today to support JDCA, join the state chapter, sign up for our National Day of Action on May 17th. We are organizing digitally and on campuses and in relevant states around the country. Our relevant states include the states that the Electoral College will make a difference, states where there's a competitive Senate race, and districts where there's a seat that we want to make sure we protect and or take the opportunity to win an additional congressional democratic seat. We want to engage all of you. I think the recommendations that were made at the end here by our guests were compelling. Uh, join JDCA, contribute to JDCA. We are actually targeting our community in races that will make a difference and will help elect the next president of the United States. So this is the most important election of our lifetime as it's already been said. And I hope you will all enjoy, join us by supporting JDCA. I hope you'll join us again next Tuesday at this time for our next call. In the meantime, stay healthy and safe. Talk to you soon.